All right, how many genres of music do you think there are? According to Spotify, there's over 6,000 genres. They break their whole music catalog down into 6,000 different genres, and they even made half of them up. So like, why are they doing this? Well, as anybody who's ever gone on a road trip with anybody else can tell you, not all rock is rock, not all hip hop is hip hop, and after two hours, you have to change it up. Um, but they do much more than just allowing them to do this classification. By putting different songs into these different micro genres, they're essentially tagging the song. They're saying this song belongs to this group, this song belongs to this group. And when they do that, it enables an entirely different data loop like one I've written here, which is overly simplistic. They do much more than this, but it gives them all these extra capabilities. There's something else you should notice about these data loops. Um, the tags that they use for these songs are not like the typical genres you've seen. You see they explain it as scream, sharp. They use these really descriptive terms for their songs. So by the end of this talk, I would love you to notice two things. One of them, pay attention to these market-leading apps because they all operate on this basis of systems, uh, on signals, excuse me, and tags. Uh, and the second thing is I want you to notice these tags aren't just decorative, they're actually driving the user experience. So companies like Spotify use these tags to increase user engagement, user satisfaction, user value. But most companies don't approach those problems that way. Most companies are still routing all of their data over to these decisions about which ways to contact users through teams, uh, most centrally, usually a data science or analytics team. These teams exist to take all of the data and crunch it and stage it and put it into insights that then a non-technical user could pick up and try to use. So, for example, you might take use your app events to find the last time you saw the user. You might go to your point of sale system and find the last, uh, create some sort of measure of lifetime value. Put those two things together into a segment that we'll call uh, high value active users. And then now that that segment exists, you can now look at how many users are in it, you can see how it's performing, and most importantly, CRM team or product could then take that segment and then use that to change the, exper uh, the experience for those users. The challenge with that way of doing things is that it is full of human-sized bottlenecks. You have to wait for your engineering team to turn around the data processing, you have to wait for your data science team to be able to create those metrics, and you have to rely on a lot of humans to then take that information and use it both appropriately and in a timely manner, and that just doesn't happen very often. It's not the human's fault. There are a lot of, every user in your app, has a different experience, has different preferences, and there is no way for a human to be able to handle that kind of flood of information. There is no analytics team large enough that they could actually analyze each individual user, and there is no CRM team large enough that they could actually act on individual insights even if you produced that. And so what these teams end up doing and what the modern communication stack is designed and limited to do is to set a bunch of static rules, user segments, message triggers, lots of if-then logic. It's not that these rules work well, they don't. It's that these rules allow all of the humans who are working on this problem to take an incredibly complex situation and treat it as something less complex. They're adapting the situation to meet their needs, not adapting their capability to meet the situation. That's not how the most innovative companies do it. Most innovative companies take an entirely different approach, an entirely different basis for their decision making, using agents. An agent is a particular type of AI that can operate autonomously within boundaries. If you have used a large language model like ChatGPT, then you have used an agent. Large language models take 
boundaries. If you tell GPT to talk to you in English, it will return English. You tell it to talk to you in German, it returns German. You tell it to talk to you in code, it returns code. It has a lot of room for creativity within those boundaries, but it does take your guidance. Agents don't only have to operate on language. They can operate on behavior as well. Most notably, they can operate on your event stream. All of it, not just a few of the funnel events, but every button click, every page visited, every social media share. They can take all of that data, process it for an individual user, and then choose good next steps to engage that user. They do this through four basic capabilities, some of which they have in common with LLMs, some of which are actually unique to a behavioral agent. So, surrogates. If you are a, uh, an e-commerce app, you ultimately want users to buy. If you're a streaming app, you want users to listen or to watch. If you're a gaming app, you want them to play. But every time you reach out to a user or they come to your app, not, they're not going to do that every single time. But they will often do something. A surrogate model is a particular type of machine learning model that will take a goal event and identify precursors, predictors. So the agent is able to assess intention. It's able to say, this user isn't doing the thing. They aren't going to the finish line yet, but they're moving in the right direction. That's a core human capability. We use that every time we talk to one another. And surrogate models allow a behavioral agent to mimic that capability. Embeddings are a information map. If you take all of that event stream from your app, agents are able to condense that into a, a representation that they can navigate easily in order to find similarities and differences between users. So if a user is not converting, but they are doing other things, the agent that's assigned to that user can then go navigate the embeddings to find other users who have similar behavioral profiles, but are converting, and ask those agents what worked for them, and then apply those lessons to the user it's assigned to. Edges are connections in a graph. Uh, if you have two pairs of shoes of the same brand, then they are connected by an edge in the graph. If you have uh, two uh, songs that are connected by a genre, then they have an edge in that graph, a connection. If you have two messages that have the same value proposition, there's an edge in that content graph. Ed the edges allow agents to identify what users have experienced so far, what they haven't experienced, and see what the next best step is. What's the next thing you could do that would engage that user? And all of this rolls up into weights, which are a way for a, a virtual agent to maintain working memory. If you send a message about how Nike shoes are popular right now, and the user responds positively to that, the agent has a representation of Nike, and it has a weight associated with that representation, it's going to move that weight up. And it's going to have a representation and a weight of shoes, and it's going to upweight that. And it's going to have a representation of the notion of popularity. It's going to upweight that. So it allows the agent to learn what works and what doesn't and to maintain that memory over time. Just as it's possible to train an AI to complete a sentence, it is possible to train an AI to read the room, to connect dots, to apply lessons learned. And with those tools, the AI is able to act autonomously within the guidelines you set. Thanks, Sean. So we talked about what the agent is. Now let's show some examples of it actually in action. So this is a capability. The first capability of an agentic CDP is an adaptive and organic user experience that the agent actually builds on its own. So before we get into that, let's look at what the current user experience looks like with a lot of apps. We're sending a very consistent number of pushes per day. They come around the same time per day. The message is very similar with some changes. Um, I, use, I use Blinkist, oh, there it is. I use Blinkist up here, uh, but they are just one example. This is very, very common. As another example, this is from Monopoly Go. You can see that they have 
seven messages. So if you're not an active player, you will get one of these messages per day, and every seven days it cycles. You start right back at the top, and the loop continues week after week. So we have to ask, like, why do user experiences like this exist with our, you know, our fixed, rigid rules? And one reason is because the tools that we use to build them force us into that. They are rigid tools. They are flowcharts. Flowcharts create these rules. They, they're not adaptive. They're not organic. An agent would never create a user experience like that. Here's what they do instead. So this is a map of a single user on their journey with an app. The gray humps indicate activity, so someone is on the app. Uh, the dots at the top, the orange and red and brown, are things that we're particularly interested in. So like a purchase, an add to cart, something like that. The blue dots at the bottom are the messages. Again, this is totally driven by an agent. There's not a human in the loop in this part of the process. So what you'll notice is there's some initial activity and we send some messages. The user doesn't respond. So we slow down our cadence. We don't want the user to churn. We're not gonna send them a message every single day. We're adapting to their level of response, but we're not giving up. You notice the agent sends a message and we get a response. And then as the user starts to adapt and starts to respond, we are start sending more messages to encourage that higher level of engagement. So you notice this user would have been churned. This is six weeks of time between activity, but we brought them back. Can you imagine if we would have messaged them every single day? Now compare that with this user over the same time frame. They got a lot of messages, but they're very active. The messages are adding to their experience and they're reacting to them. This is truly adaptive. Uh, this is one other quick example I wanted to show. This is from an e-commerce app. If you notice the middle bump in the middle there, there's some activity. They viewed some items. Our agent sent that cluster of three messages. One of those messages was a 35% discount. Well, what happened is you'll notice that they didn't convert. Okay, we sent another message later, gave them a rest, came back. They actually added something to their cart. That's that red dot. Our agent responded by sending a 15% discount and they actually converted. The agent learned, I don't need to give away as much of my margin, they're higher intent at this point, so I can send a smaller discount. So when we switch people over into the agentic user journeys, what we notice is, yes, a lift in conversions, but what's almost more significant is this massive drop in messages sent for all the reasons I just showed you. This helps retention, um, and for this customer, this was SMS messages, so this is big money. Um, this is hundreds of thousands of dollars in savings as well. So the second capability is our deep understanding of user motivations. With a one-to-one -one agent, we understand individual users better. So another example from industry, this is from Netflix. You can see the Umbrella Academy. They have the usual stuff you'd expect. They have the cast, they have genres like Spotify. But then they put these, this show is, it's mind-bending, it's offbeat, it's quirky. Again, like Spotify, they're using these labels that are almost conversational. It's how we describe it to friends. Why it's significant? If we built a recommender system off of something like the actor, someone watches Breaking Bad, we notice Brian Cranston's in it, we recommend Kung Fu Panda 3. It might be right for some people. It might be totally wrong suggestion for other people. Now, let's say we do our recommender based on these tags. Breaking Bad is dark, it's gritty. We might recommend John Wick. A lot closer. Using these tags allows you to do much, much better recommendations. So in our product, we allow tagging on everything. Every title you put in, every description, every picture, every, everything gets one of these tags because they are that important. And here's what the output looks like. So these are three user IDs from an app that has well over 10 million users. But you can see how they respond to each tag. So user one is motivated by convenience. User two is by value. What's the cheapest option? User three, it's funny, I forgot to highlight it, but it's availability. I want what's now. That's actually their strongest driver. Three very different customers. So we can serve them three very different customer experiences, even about the same product. We can change the title, description, the photo, all of it based on what they show that they're interested in. So if this is so great, why isn't everybody doing it? Well, according to Netflix, it's a lot of work. They have over 3,000 tags for their movies, and they have 30 full-time tag, uh, tag managers who are assigning tags, making sure they're the right tags, assigning tags to movies and things like that. And according to them, each time they remove tags, engagement plummets. It is obvious, it is a very strong key to their success. Let's look at another capability. Chatbots can be frustrating. <laughs> Every app has menus, filters, search capabilities, and oftentimes using a chatbot feels like you're trying to convince the bot to navigate those menus for you. The reason for this is that chatbots 
are naive. So you might have a user who really cares about service and efficiency. You might have another user who cares a lot about variety and incentives. But both of those users and all the others need to teach the chatbot those preferences every single time they use the interface because the chatbot doesn't have a memory. And we can do better than that. Here is the original version of a bot we prototyped with one of our customers. You can see that the user is asking for a dress for a formal event. The bot asks about color, the user answers. The bot asks about uh, length, the user answers. The bot asks about other details, the user answers. So it's basically going through and applying filtering criteria in a conversational way. And when you look at the answers it gives you, Look at the descriptions, the, re the value propositions, the reason it gives the user to want to look at these dresses. Flattering fit, it's pretty generic. No one really is looking for an unflattering fit. You look at the other ones, sophistication, romance, glamour, rich and luxurious, those are all very much tied to the original prompt of looking for a dress for a formal event. Now, if you are going to a charity gala, those terms might speak to you. If you're my 14-year-old daughter booking for a dress for the spring formal, I guarantee you she's not gonna be motivated by sophistication. So there's a better way to do this. Every large language model can take a system prompt. It's a behind the scenes set of instructions. The end user never sees this. We were able to take the same bot and feed in the weights that our agent for this particular user had developed based on other experiences in the app. So we knew that they look for trend setting and fresh looks. We knew that they are prioritized above everything else, an effortless and personalized experience. So very same chatbot, but now with these new instructions in the background, much shorter path to value. This is all it asked. They asked for a dress. The bot said, anything else? They said, ah, maybe something blue and you get the answer. Now, that might not be the best experience for everyone, but this particular user cares about not having an effortful experience. They want it to be easy, so we made it easy. And then look at the way it describes the dresses. Making a statement, timeless and elegant. Terms tied to what that user already values about the products on this app. Every time a user engages with an app, that is a conversation. It doesn't have to be within a chatbot for it to count as a conversation. We can take all of that information and make the chatbot aware of it by pulling that information that the agents collect. One last capability we'll talk about, recommender systems. Uh, very important and lots and lots of debate about how to build them correctly. This is not an academic topic. Amazon estimates that 35% of its revenue comes from its recommendation engine. Netflix estimates that 75% of its views come from recommendations. This is my, home, my Amazon homepage. These are not just a bunch of recommendations from one system. They're actually multiple systems, all using different criteria to try to guess what I would like. We had a, a, a customer recently, a, a, deliver, a food delivery app, that was faced with this same situation. You have four recommenders operating on everything from the user's individual uh, order history to restaurant popularity. And they wanted to know how can they decide which recommender to use. In an app, you can just put all of them up in different places like Amazon does. But when you're sending a message, you only got one message. You got to choose something. So we assigned tags to the recommenders, the actual systems, and the agents were able to learn user preferences for each system. And so you can see that there was one system that was very popular. In fact, 45% of the users exclusively liked that system. But there were another 9% of users that exclusively liked the worst performing system. If we had only gone, picked a winner and gone with the one best system, we would have left a lot of value on the table. But also, this highlights one of the benefits of agents. When, you, when an agent makes a decision and actually does something on your behalf, it becomes a data factory it learns from the user's response, and that response becomes new data for the next iteration. So what we've covered here, the unfair advantage, is really just a data loop. These companies start out with some data, may not be more than what you have, but then using this system of tags and agents, they grow that data, they enrich the metadata, and they get to learn so much more and generate all this data on their own and then feed it back into their products. 
We know that these market leading apps are not doing simple A-B tests and static rules and user journeys. They are using agents. And now you guys can too.